wanted to do a video on the subject of risk in atrial fibrillation. Okay, Now, most people understand that in atrial fibrillation, there is an increased risk of stroke. But unfortunately and truthfully, very few people really understand this concept of risk. And often when I'm talking to patients and trying to explain to them about strokes, etc., and the risk of strokes, they often say to me, look, you know, I feel all right at the moment. Can I not just see how things go? Um, uh, because I don't fancy taking anticoagulants at the moment. Can I not just see in three to six months time how I'm doing and then uh, we can reassess? And I, at that point, have to have a chat with them and try and make them understand a little bit about risk. So I thought I'd do a video today to try and explain this concept of risk. Okay. Now, number one, risk is defined as the probability of something harmful happening. So the first thing to understand is that there is very little relationship between how you feel and what your future risk is. Have a look at this diagram that I did here. Okay, let me just see if I can bring this up. Okay, risk. Now, here's a guy who's leaving home, all right? He leaves home and how he feels at that time when he's walking down this road to work is his quality of life. He may feel great. He may be having a great day. He may feel awful. He may have had a, you know, he may have a lot on his mind. How he feels is quality of life. That has very little bearing on whether or not he will fall in this manhole which lies on his way to work. All right. What governs whether he's going to fall into the manhole to a large extent depends on the size of the manhole not on how he is feeling at the time. And that's really, really crucial, all right, to understand. Uh, so, sorry, so um, it is very important not to mistake how you feel with your future risk. A person with daily migraines, for example, may feel awful all the time, but may go on and have completely normal life expectancy and live till they're 90. A person with a brain tumour, uh, which is silent, may not even know anything and may be leading a normal quality of life, but may not necessarily live a very long time because of the brain tumour. So when you're contemplating any treatment, it is very important for you to understand which medications are being prescribed for your quality of life and which medications are being prescribed to cover your future risk, okay? And it's important not to confuse how you feel with your risk. Now, the second thing to understand about risk is no one can reliably say to you that no one can exactly tell you what your risk is of anything, all right? However, it is possible to study a population of people just like you and from that, you can work out the risk of that population. And you do so by following those people up over a set period of time and seeing how many people come to harm. And from that, it is possible to estimate a risk for that population and extrapolate that and apply that to you. So uh, let me explain this to you. All right. As I say here, here is this. Uh, so what you can do is no one can reliably say the chances that this man is going, no one can reliably say this, is, this man's risk is, you know, so many percent. But what they can say is that if we looked at 100 people for a year uh, who were walking down this path and worked out how many of them fell through the manhole, then we can calculate or estimate the size of the manhole. And from that, we can also use that to extrapolate that and say, well, as one person who would be in that population of 100, this would be your risk, all right? So in <clears throat> atrial fibrillation, the, the, um, the risk or the size of the manhole is dependent on, number one, age. The older you are, the bigger the manhole. Diabetes, high blood pressure, previous strokes, uh, heart failure, vascular disease, and for women, sex, you know, uh, the female sex, all right? And those are the things that control the size of the manhole. And the more of these you have, the bigger the manhole, 
All right. So, for example, what they did was in the um, in the uh, on one of the studies. So, for example, if you are under the age of 65 and you don't have diabetes, high blood pressure, previous strokes, heart failure, vascular disease, and you're male, then they've worked out that when a hundred people walked across this road, okay, who were young with no comorbidities virtually no one fell into the manhole uh, in a year. However, if you became 65 or if you were above the age of 65, okay, above the age of 65 but less than 75, and they took people who were above the age of 65, no comorbidities, and followed 100 people above the age of 65, then they found that at the end of the year, 1.3% Okay, 1.3, well, I mean 1.3 uh, people would have fallen through this hole. If you took people who had two risk factors, like um, if you were above the age of 75 or if you were above the age of 65 and say had diabetes, then your risk went up to 2.2%, 2.2%. If you had three, uh, a score of three, then it went up to 3.2%. If you had a risk, uh, if you had uh, a score of four, it went up to 4% and so on and so forth. So this is how risk is calculated, okay? Uh, let me just get this up again. Sorry, where is it? Um, sorry, I've just lost uh, my page. Okay, fine. So the, the size of the manhole is calculated, the size of the manhole is dependent on the comorbidities and the age of the patient. Atrial fibrillation itself probably doesn't affect the size of the manhole very much. We know that because people who have atrial fibrillation who are under the age of 65, who don't have any comorbidities, have, you know, no one has a stroke or virtually very few people have a stroke. And therefore, atrial fibrillation probably doesn't increase the size of the manhole, but is, is more like a, a, a hazard sign here. Okay, it's telling you that this is a manhole and this is a bigger manhole and you need to pay attention to it. So it's like a hazard sign. So it's a marker of, uh, it's a marker rather than an actual contributor to the size of the manhole. All right, it's a marker saying that, you know, you need to pay attention to this manhole. And this is why it doesn't really matter whether the atrial fibrillation is there or not, the manhole still exists. And because of that, I often say to my patients, you know, those patients who say to me, well, look, you know, um, uh, can I not take it if my atrial fibrillation gets worse? Well, I say, well, the atrial fibrillation has already pointed out to you that there's a manhole. The atrial fibrillation is just a marker. If you take the marker away, that doesn't mean that the manhole has been taken away. It doesn't mean that the manhole has suddenly become shrunk in size. The manhole still exists. And this is why once you have atrial fibrillation, you have to be alerted to the fact that there is this manhole which is governed by your comorbidities, not by the presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. All right. Uh, now, so the other thing to understand is that the manhole can only ever increase in size because one of the determinants of the manhole one of the one of the contributors to the manhole increasing is age and as we all get older the manhole can only ever get bigger in size all right it doesn't get bigger hugely but every year it gets a little bit bigger and especially if you for example don't have diabetes and then develop diabetes well that suddenly increases the size of the manhole Remember, you don't just develop diabetes. Uh, diabetes is something that develops over a period of time, but you've hit a mark where people start paying notice and saying, now you have diabetes. But that doesn't mean that you've just developed diabetes on that day. You've probably been developing it, and all you've done is you've crossed that threshold where people define it as diabetes. So what I'm saying is that as time progresses, the size of the manhole can only ever get bigger. But you can do two things to try and reduce the size of the manhole. The first and foremost thing you can do is by paying attention to your lifestyle. So if you are 
um, overweight, if you have sleep apnea, if you uh, are eating the wrong food, if you smoke, you're more likely to age quicker, you're more likely to develop diabetes, you're more likely to develop high blood pressure. And <clears throat> therefore, by maintaining a good lifestyle, you are certainly significantly reducing the rate of progression of the size of the manhole. So you're reducing the likelihood of the manhole getting bigger. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing to understand is that you can also partially cover the manhole by taking anticoagulants. So things like warfarin or apixaban, dibigatran, rivaroxaban, edoxaban. Anticoagulants will not affect how you feel. Okay, they're not there to try and affect your quality of life. They simply work by reducing your risk. It is very much like someone puts a cover on the manhole and the cover aims to cover the manhole by 60%. Okay, so here's a cover and this cover has now covered the manhole by about 60%. But bear in mind that the manhole is still going to only ever get bigger. So if you want this to stop getting bigger, one of the best things you can do is pay attention to lifestyle. All right, and if you pay attention to lifestyle, good food, good exercise, good sleep, minimizing stress, avoiding toxins like cigarettes will significantly reduce the chances of this getting bigger. And the anticoagulant will, will cover this manhole by about 60%. If you take an antiplatelet like aspirin, that will only cover the manhole by 20%. And that is why it is no longer recommended that people take aspirin or clopidogrel for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. It's far better to take an anticoagulant. All right. The problem, one of the problems, however, with anticoagulants is that even though you take the anticoagulant and it covers this, the bigger the manhole, the thicker the cover, all right? I.e., by that I mean that, <clears throat> and the problem with a thicker cover is that the person may be walking along and they may not fall in the manhole, but they may trip over the cover. And this is why, and, the co and the, by that what I mean is that the more risks you have for a stroke, the greater your risk is of bleeding as a consequence of being on anticoagulants. So that is the hazard that comes along with the anticoagulants, that the bigger the manhole, the thicker the cover, i.e. the more likely you are to trip over the cover and, uh, and suffer a complication as a result of the anticoagulants. However, there is no doubt in my mind that if the manhole is very big, then the best thing you can do is a reduce the rate of progression of the manhole by working on your lifestyle and secondly covering it by two-thirds by taking an anticoagulant even though uh, uh, the, the bigger the manhole the slightly greater the, the greater the risk of complications from anticoagulants but regardless of that the overall benefit of anticoagulation is far greater than the risks it presents all right so I hope this was useful. The main messages from my um, disjointed talk are, um, here are the main messages. Do not confuse how you feel with your risk. Your risk is governed by your age and your com comorbidities and not by the presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. Your risk can only ever go up and therefore there really is no merit in waiting and just to decide whether to go on anticoagulants or not. Anticoagulation will reduce your risk by 60%, but carries its own risks of causing bleeding. And finally, lifestyle modification is always worthwhile because it will not only stop your risk from increasing, but has no side effects and will also interestingly make you feel better. So I hope this was useful. Uh, I'd love to hear what you think of this video. If you think I could have made it better, please let me know. If you enjoyed it, please let me know. This is the kind of thing that really motivates me, that fills me with lots of enthusiasm. Um, you can come and join me. Now I'm doing a live Facebook chat every Tuesday. So if you have any questions, come along, become friends with me on Facebook, and I'll try and answer your questions every Tuesday. It's a live Facebook chat, so you can ask any questions you like. My Facebook ID is York Cardiology one Y-O-R-K-C-A-R-D-I-O-L-O-G-Y-1. Um, my email address is yorkcardiology at gmail.com. 
My website is www.yourcardiology.co.uk and you can actually send me a message and if you want to talk to me, you can do so through that. Um, I have a Twitter handle, which is Your Cardiology. So thank you so, so much. Um, if you get a chance and, um, you know, please do look up uh, the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, which is, a, which is a charity which is very close to my heart. And it would mean a lot to me if you took some time just to look at all the great work they do for animals, uh, because I'm very passionate about animals. Um, uh, so that would not really be a very nice gesture. Thank you so much. All the best. Have a great night. Take care.